this is probably a good time to move into talking about your greatest collaborator, uh, Jill Kiley, and artistic fraud. So uh, when did you start working with Jill and about approximately how many projects have you done with her sure. through the years? Um, well, the interesting thing about myself and Jill Kiley, <laughs> there are many interesting <laughs> things. The interesting thing about myself and Jill Kiley uh, is we are both from the same small town, uh, um, which is the Goulds. Okay. It's called the Goulds. It's now part of St. John's, but when we were growing up, it wasn't. It's a small farming community just outside St. John's, about 20 minutes outside St. John's. Um, and up until, I'm going to get the dates wrong, but up until like 96, 97, um, there was a denomination, denominational education in Newfoundland. So if you were Catholic, you went to one school. If you were Protestant, you went to another school. Jill was Catholic. I was Protestant. She's a year older than me. Uh, our parents knew each other. Our brothers played hockey together. Uh, I'm sure I passed her on the street numerous times, and I met her when I was 21. Oh. Um, because we went to different right. schools, yeah. and the same goes for the same goes for all all the other Catholics too, the Alan Doyles of the world and the Alan Hawkos of the world. All these guys that you know are within the circle of this little tiny community that I just didn't meet until I was uh, well into my adult years. So as I started doing that mon drama thing that I was talking about earlier, um, Jill was at, at York University, and so people were constantly saying, "Oh, you're from the Ghouls. You must know Jill Kylie." I don't know Jill Kylie. I don't know who Jill Kylie is. And she apparently was getting it from people as well. You must know Robert Che. And she didn't know. And so uh, it was actually a mutual friend of ours, uh, Leah Lewis, um, who Jill was dropping into the... Jill was at the Canada Student Employment Office dropping off some job calls. She was doing uh, um, some... Uh, work at the LSPU Hall, one of her summers home, and she was doing putting together a festival, and she was dropping off some job calls. And myself and Leah were there for something. I guess one of us was applying for a job. And uh, and I met Jill then, and then she kind of said, you know, you should, you should, you, you wrote a play, right? You should write a monologue for this cabaret. And so I ended up doing a couple of monologues for this cabaret that she was uh, directing. And then she, when she graduated, she came home and did this show, In Your Dreams Freud, and she ended up casting me in that. Um, and we became really, really good friends very, very quickly over the process of that. And uh, and then we one thing that we um, we always found great communion on was uh, we had both had these tremendously influential and tremendously um, dramatic bouts of unrequited love that we talked about quite frequently. That I had I had fallen. You're fun to talk about. <laughs> I it's love. a theme in my work. Um, I had fallen, you know, when I had come out, I had yeah. fallen so desperately in love with this guy that, that didn't know I was alive. And and, uh, and Jill had fallen desperately in love with this guy when she was uh, in her teen years um, that didn't know she was alive. And we used to tell stories about it all the time. Right. And then one night at a Christmas party, she came to me, you know, we were both drunk and having fun. And she said, I've got this great idea for a show. And it's like, what's the... So, so it's a woman. At the beginning of the woman is staying there. And it's just a white sheet. And this woman, you know, she says, he doesn't even know I'm alive. And then like 40 heads pop up from underneath the sheet and go, no, he doesn't. And they start singing. And they sing, Robert, a cappella. They don't have any... They can sing all the way through the show. And it's like an opera. But like the woman on top of the sheet has this love story with this guy. And they're just talking. And they don't sing. But like they're talking and there's this music behind it. And she kind of described what eventually became Under Wraps. And she said, you know, I want you to write it because you totally get it, right? Because you went through it with this guy. And it was supposed to be her story, but of course, as soon as I started to write it, yeah. it was, it was <laughs> a story. story. <laughs> and so, um, so that was kind of the first collaboration that we did as writer-director. And I guess if the show didn't, had, w didn't work or the show had not worked somehow... Um, or if it hadn't been the success that it was, it might have just ended there. I mean, we enjoyed working together, but it was this big success. It was this big um, hit, and, uh, and then we ended up touring it, and, and that kind of brought the company a bit of national acclaim. People started to get to know, uh, I think specifically Jill at that time, because the show, I mean, I'm very proud of what the show was. And as a Were cathartic, you the actor as well? I was well? the actor yes. in it as well. And I, I was saw that show, yeah. actually. <laughs> I was very proud of the kind of cathartic purge that it was as a piece right. of writing like you know and we're going back to it now and fixing it up and stuff uh and you know I'm, i was really proud of it for what it is but as a, a piece of theater it was really jill's it was really jill's statement um that she was throwing out there into the world that it was an announcement of a, a really profoundly different way of thinking um about newfoundland theater certainly but to see this 
young woman come out uh, very young and and proclaim herself so boldly with such yes. a, a a sizable and audacious piece of directing i think um really opened the eyes of a lot of people in the company to her but also the, the company you know right and uh, so that was the first thing we did. And then, uh, you know, uh, though we just started, because of the success of that, we started collaborating quite frequently after that. We did uh, a piece of mine, Empty Girl, uh, for RCA Theatre the year after that. And, uh, and then I, I came on board, uh, I, you know, in those, that, those are the years I was involved with Artistic Fraud, mostly as, um, uh, as an actor. And then I came on as a board member at one point. And then around 2000, 2001, I became Artistic Associate. And by that point, the work had really fallen into a place where it was really, for the most part, uh, collaboration between myself and Jill as writer and director. So and together, I guess we've created about uh, 10 pieces. I'm, I'm guessing I'd have wow. to do the math. But, wow. Yeah. And what do you think working with Jill has brought to you to put on the page? Like, how, how do you think working with her has developed your own work? Well... One of the, Jill had this Jill had this fascination about music, and she still does. I mean, it's in all of our pieces. It's changed in how it's in our pieces, but it's still there. But when she was um, when she was in school, she did this piece. Uh, uh, she was doing a comedia class, and uh, they were talking about comedic timing, and she wanted to explore comedic timing, and she did a comedia uh, piece that was uh, timed to a Dave Brubeck tune. Um, four people cheating on a test. It was time to this Dave Brubeck tune. And then in performance, she pulled the tune out. And so you just saw the rhythms of the tune in the actions of the actors and the acting, but you couldn't hear the tune. It's stuff she was playing with at 22, you know? Right. Uh, different, just a different take on, on and they're all very influenced by Edward Gordon Craig and the whole Uber Marionette and, and, and prescriptive directing. And she was really fascinated by... Um, the theater as a director's medium and she really wanted to explore that um so when she came home um and Andrews Freud had aspects of that as well all the choral work was in that already um she did the she did that piece on a larger scale when she she came home in 1996 she did a piece called the cheat that was about I think six minutes long and it's uh it was um 82 people wow uh, choreographed to Box Fugue in G minor. Da, 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 And she took the fugue, her and Dave Summers, who's still on our board of directors, he was on our board of directors then, still constant board member of the company, um, sat down and meticulously worked through the lines of Box Fugue and assigned, um, assigned actions to each note value. So wow. if there were quarter notes, but ticking with a pencil and then when in performance you know it was a grid of nine by nine school desks with all these kids cheating on a math exam and in performance the music was pulled out and it was conducted there was a conductor down in front who would conduct it and all of us were watching the conductor and counting 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 doing um and under wraps had a similar thing like everything was timed to the music so as i started you know under wraps was like third fourth show that i've written so everything since then has been written most of it has been written in collaboration with a director whose mind works that way. Right. And uh, that music and rhythm uh, is a huge consideration to the final product. So uh, I became this, I was talking to the students yesterday in my workshops about it, that, you know, they were asking me, so I was talking about conflict and tension and scenes and dramatic tension. And and it was like, is that what you think about when you write? And it's like, no, it's not. That That stuff kind of became... I think you know as a, as a writer as well, like that stuff kind of becomes uh, instinct. That that yeah. comes the kind of base instinct like the of writing. The bone structure. Yeah, the bone structure of it. But what I'm actually thinking about and what I actually focus really hard on and have to really, really work at, and it's my primary goal with certainly first two or three drafts, is rhythm. And the rhythm of a sentence and how a sentence ties into the next sentence. Um, it's become almost like a, a musical thing for me. Uh, and that's coming from working with Jill. That's right. that, that work that we started to do really early on. And the fact that like under wraps, for example, um, under wraps, for example, when we actually got into production with that show, uh, it has a score going behind it. So the, the lead characters in communication and conversation with the chorus all the way through who are singing a line. So the chorus would be singing, do, 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 ba, do, 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 yes, do, do, ba, do, 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 no. So I'd have that, that bar or two bars in between to ask the question that they're responding to. Oh, okay. So we'd come into rehearsal and Petrina would go, you know, Robert, the question's too long. Can you lose a couple of words? Right. 
So the process of writing that show right. was really a process of me digging in and finding rhythm and finding, and so greatly changed how I wrote like the the poetry of oh, what I, I do. It, it became yeah. really rhythmically focused for me. Well, it's interesting when you said that uh, Jill was interested in. Uh, theater as a director's medium, mm -hmm. I felt these little hairs come up <laughs> on the back of my neck. So I have to ask you, as a playwright, uh, with such a big, you know, a big presence as a director, one with very strong views, um, can you talk about your best collaboration moment and your worst collaboration moment? Sure. Um... Weirdly, the best collaboration moment I think is ongoing. I don't think I can actually. I don't think I can actually pin it down to one thing. It's just such a joy all the time. I mean, Jill. Jill also. To talk a little bit about Jill and to kind of frame her a little bit more fairly, um, that's where she started, and I think she still is that in many many ways. But she is uh, not just because she's you know my best friend. She's she's the most highly collaborative artist I've ever worked with and people are surprised by that given that the, the given the aesthetic that she's exploring and and given the fact that that she does want to try to make the theater a director's medium and that that's where she's coming from she's incredibly uh, collaborative relies very very heavily on the will and and the idea of her actors um, relies upon it doesn't just welcome it relies upon it um, so it, it's not like you're coming in and, and uh, you're, you're marching to someone else's tune. There, there really I is, a, yeah, it, it really, and that's, you know, and, and in terms of how story functions in our work, that's really evolved more and more over the years as well. What, uh, what she was playing with uh, as an experimenter, um, a pure kind of theoretical experimentation with rhythm uh, in storytelling when she first started has turned into a kind of more organic treatment of that. It, it really um, is present in the work in a more organic way. So uh, we don't so much anymore, like in the early days of Jill charting things out, I measure see, my measure and, see, okay. and grids. We don't really work that way anymore. But what she's learned and what she, the aesthetics she's developed by doing that totally has a place in the work constantly, always. Uh, but it, it's reliant upon what the actor wants to do now and the motivation of the actor. They're not gridded to come in and be in certain okay. places. So that's really changed and evolved over the years. Um, the, the best the best thing about it is that, uh, the best thing about it, working with Jill, is that I don't have to explain myself, that our, our goals in the theatre, you know, probably because we've grown up together in the theatre, our goals in the theatre are, I think, identical. Mm -hmm. Um she totally gets what I'm trying to do. Um, it's peculiar when we work with, a, you know, sometimes when we work with a dramaturg and there'll be a question for me, Jill will kind of look at me like, I, I get it. Like, you know, points of clarification that other people don't get. Jill is like, she's inside my head. She totally gets what I'm trying to do, the intent of it. Um, worst, I mean, the worst moment, I think we, we, had a, we had a blip She'll hate me for talking about this. We had a blip uh, in uh, in, uh, in when we were working on After Image, um, where, and it came from actual. It came from a moment of of, of her trying to be um, to be really generous. Uh, we had this blip where because um, she was negotiating, uh, there was something going wrong in the scene. The scene wasn't working for me, and she was trying to negotiate between what I felt was going wrong, what she felt should happen, and what the composer, uh, Jonathan Monroe, uh, felt should be happening musically. And she was trying to negotiate those three things, and she wasn't. She couldn't quite get her head around it right away. And so we had a meeting about it, uh, separately, myself and her outside the room, we had a meeting about it. And then, um, out of desire to make good on what she kind of understood in principle that I was asking for, we went back into the rehearsal hall and... Uh, and she tried to make it happen, and it wasn't happening. And and she kind of asked me to explain to the actors, and it was this horrible kind of. I, I I'm not a director. I can't explain to the actors. And so we kind of we kind of stopped the process for a second. I said to Elena, you know, we, you know, she's like, I I just I just felt like I, I wanted you to have the opportunity to try to to execute what you were explaining outside the room, and then I had to say to her. It's like that's very generous of you, but you also have to know that that this is your show and that you have to understand it. Like I can have a feeling about something 
I can have a real strong opinion about something, but uh, you have to embody it. You have to understand it. And if you don't understand it, you can't give it this direction. Right. It's not fair to your actors for you to try to, to filter a direction from me. And I might be wrong. Right. I, I'm, I often am, and you're often right. So <laughs> she's sometimes right. Um, and so that, you know, that was really, you know, so I mean, this is like, you know, the eighth project we worked on, and we're still, still negotiating because she is so great and so collaborative and because she wants me in the room a lot and because she wants to talk about things and she wants my opinion, she wants to know that I'm happy um, and she uh, is open to my ideas. Because of that, there's still a negotiation of how that works with the other collaborators in the room, when that happens, how it should happen. Right. Um, so we have a couple little moments, you know, but the fact that I mentioned that one will yeah. give you an indication of how smooth... Yes. Our relationship yes. really is. Uh, um, it's someone pretty... described it to me as a, 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 like a marriage, like a really strong marriage. <laughs> you know how there's some marriages where people bitch about each other all the time, yeah. you know, or they have these running jokes about each other or something, but that from the outside, you guys just seem so solid. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that, and I think that's accurate. I mean, I sometimes worry, I actually sometimes worry, and I've never expressed this to her, I sometimes worry that, that our working relationship has um, deteriorated our, our, our non-working relationship insofar as it seems sometimes that all we ever talk about when we get together is work. That worries me a little bit. Um, it was really great. She had a, a baby last year. Who I love. She's the best, best kid. Um, so that gives us something else to talk about. <laughs> you know, but like yeah, invariably, myself and Jill will get into a room and we'll start talking about like, I'll start asking her questions about how it's going at the NAC. She'll start asking me questions about artistic fraud. We'll start talking about projects we want to do in the future. Um, and that's great that that can happen, but we see each other not so much anymore because, you know, she's living in a different city. And so it does it does concern me a little these days that we have to find time to talk about boys again, you know? Yeah. <laughs> we have to gossip. We have yeah. to we have to joke around. and Just like a marriage has to have yeah, playful moments. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. So uh, we have to protect that. I mean, not that the friendship is in right. dire straits by no means, but uh, I... Uh, uh, You're I missing her in yeah, a way. Yeah, I'm missing yeah. her a little bit. Whoa, that's really confessional. She's going to find that out watching <laughs> But yeah, I, I worry that um, I worry that the the relationship, um, given that the, the time constraint is on a little bit more, that the the relationship doesn't fully become a working relationship, right. more so than it should be.